Shalom, salam, and peace. This is another episode of The Real Diagnosis. Today's topic is going to be health and wellness. I'm pleased to have our guest on the show today, Dr. Saeed. She's a practicing board-certified family physician in Naperville. She's also a published author, The Holistic Rx, Your Guide to Healing Chronic Inflammation and Disease. She has an expertise in the area of wellness and health, and she is also able to touch on various aspects of the uh, Quran and Sunnah and the tradition in terms of how that can be applied to health and wellness. Um, she has spoken in various settings all over the world as a renowned speaker. So I'd like to welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Saeed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much for having me on. This is really exciting. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. Um, this is really a great conversation. I think it's relevant to so many different people. Can you just tell us about how you first started getting uh, into wellness, into kind of a healing? Um, what are what are some of the things that got you involved and interested in this? Oh, absolutely. You know, well, I think I started off, I mean, we've, my grandparents and them were physicians, but not conventional physicians. They were homeopathic. So they were always into uh, treating people and looking at the whole cause and full-fledged and, you know, trying to uh, help people. And uh, um, I knew growing, growing up um, in Naperville, Illinois, I grew up here all my life. And so growing up, that's always something that I always wanted to do was continue to help people. And, um, but not until did I get into residency, um, did a lot of that come to fruition because the fact that what happened was that I was diagnosed with like Hashimoto's and digestive issues and, um, acne and eczema and seborrheic dermatitis and, uh, but not until I was diagnosed with lupus and I was miserable, like my hands hurt, my joints hurt, my body hurt. And uh, my, my parents actually sacrificed everything for us to become physicians. <laughs> like literally they sold their houses, they left their jobs, they left everything for us to be all doctors. And I was a family physician, I married a family physician. Uh, my brother's an interventional cardiologist, my sister's a pediatric ICU physician. I have all these doctors in my family. Wow. And when I was, when I felt like I was really hurting and uh, um, I, I felt like I, I'm like I knew that I had a new I was a new mom a new wife a new resident all at the same time, and I realized at that time that I was not going to just let this disease. Okay. I didn't so, want to do that. So then I had to look for other ways to how I can take charge of my health, and that's when I discovered integrative holistic medicine. And since then, I have it just blown my mind nonstop. So this is this, I'm very passionate about this. So for the uninitiated or someone who's not familiar with what it means, integrative holistic medicine, how, how do you explain that? How do you explain that to your patients? Um, mm -hmm. you know, how do you broach that subject? So what that is, is, you know, conventional medicine, we've been taught to, uh, here's a problem, here's a mode of treatment. And um, where holistic medicine, we sort of take it a step further. And it's functional, holistic, integrative. So all about the same kinds of wordings, um, all stem from the same origin where you basically look towards the underlining root cause um, and asking, start asking the question, why is this person suffering to begin with? And that's where I think it's just a little bit different where conventional medicine is great for acute care. Like, obviously, you know, you're in the ER. You need conventional medicine at that time. There's no, my sister's a pediatric ICU physician. My brother's an interventional cardiologist. There's no room for anything else. That's, that's absolutely necessary. But when it comes to chronic conditions, you know, the people that you see like with fatigue and sinus issues and headaches and all of those chronic conditions, Right. Instead of just trying to like, okay, here's a pill for this, really looking under and saying, okay, why is this person off balance? What's going on that they themselves are feeling these symptoms? You know, well, what's going on in their lives? And to really take a deep dive into um, their lifestyles and to see what's off of balance there. Because we all know lifestyle and as physicians, we're taught that lifestyle is so super important. Right. right. Um, but unfortunately, that's not what we're taught. And we're not taught any classes of nutrition or life, you know, nutrition or stress management. Me as a new mom, a new wife, a new resident all at the same time, I was like, I need to learn how to stress manage. Yeah. <laughs> but I wasn't taught that, unfortunately. So then there's 
those pieces that I really help to figure out what's going on with these patients and help them fix it and then help them um, improve their overall health and well-being. So what you're talking about is something that I think a lot of people uh, struggle with. And I think it's also very frustrating for them because these are things that, like you said, these are not quick fixes, right? This is not a broken arm that needs to be set back in place. Or, no, you know, <laughs> no, absolutely not. And, and so that can be, uh, you know, quite frustrating. And it seems like you personally have kind of gone through your own experience. What are, uh, you know, what are some of the, like, what are some of the expectations people should have if they're going to kind of get involved and they want to look at something, the whole picture, they don't just want to kind of go into one sort of direction. Is there any example that you can kind of illuminate what we're talking about here? So like for the patient, I mean, the people that I see are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right. You know, and those are the people that I love seeing because they're, they're really willing to now change their lifestyle. And unfortunately, most of us are not ready to change our lifestyle because we're too comfortable with where we are right now. Um, but sometimes I don't think we just understand how both of those really play a role in each other and how how really they there's it's a beautiful dance that they play, how we feel and how our lifestyles are. And um, but like, for example, my first patient, when I originally first started this, she was she's a 31 year old with nine autoimmune diseases, myasthenia oh, gravis, wow. psoriasis, lycus planus, Sjogren's, Hashimoto's, digestive issues. Um, the list goes on and on. Psoriasis. Exa I'm like, it was just like she was had all of these chronic conditions and most of them were autoimmunities. And she was she was on the highest dose of mestinon. She's like, I do not just I don't want to go to Imuron. I'm done with that. I, I don't I, that's too scary. I have to go see the doctor. I doctor so many times I can't do that. Because every every corner I turned, I felt like there was another chronic condition. And um, she was she worked at the Family Dollar store. She worked at the gas station. She felt like she had a lot of money, but she was ready to take charge of her health. And um, she's like, I, I want to just learn what I can do to slow this down. And um, when when I approach a patient like this, it does take time. You are absolutely right because I have to. It's like a full fledged history. Then I go into a lot of detail about what their lifestyle factors are, what kind of stresses they have with social, the spiritual, um, what kind of social environment are, do they have, and then trying to figure out where they're off balance. For example, really working on their stress management. Actually, every single solitary patient that I see, I start them off, and I've been doing this for the last 14 years. Um, so every patient that I see, I have them start off with gratitude because the power of gratitude now science has really like opened up all the scientific benefits of gratitude and where heart rate variability if you're if you're frustrated your heart rate variability is all over the place and when you live a life of appreciation your heart rate variability is a nice sign wave um and it's in the quran too right in Surah Ibrahim, ayah number seven, Allah uses the strongest language in the Quran. I swear to it, I swear to it, I swear to it. I promise I'm going to increase you if you are just grateful. Subhanallah. So the gratitude makes a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, and then we have making, watching their sleep, see how they're sleeping to help optimize that. They're social to keep people away from you that are going to drag you down, keep people around you that are going to lift you up. <laughs> and then um, stress management. So 80% of the complaints that come to primary care physicians are due to stress. 80 percent or maybe even 90 percent actually but especially nowadays it's all due to stress <laughs> but um so these stress so i teach them stress management techniques and then working on their diet and their lifestyle because the difference be between somebody with a problem and somebody without a problem if we say the same anatomy books and we say the same physiology books if we're all the exact same on the inside it's our environment that makes a difference and what's really powerful is that 70 to 80 percent of our immune system lies in our gut we have a hundred trillion bacteria that line our gut lining. And so if these bacteria are off, we have problems. If they're in good harmony, then everything works properly. So really, you know, incorporating, um, you know, diet, lifestyle, and all these factors to really put somebody back into balance. So yes, it does take time. It does take a lot of work, but it's really powerful. So, um, you know, we're, we've got probably a, a, a few seconds to the break, but I think a couple of points that I thought you made that were really incredible was kind of how it just seems like so much of what's going on in our lives is it's all interwoven together. It's not like you can just Absolutely. figure things out. 
and, and that would be easier if we could separate things out. <laughs> it's always know. easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, you know, it's amazing how everything is connected. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when we come back, uh, I would like us to kind of broach the subject about how we can incorporate our faith into our healing. And then hopefully uh, we can talk a little more about that. So everyone stay tuned. We'll be back with The Real Diagnosis and Dr. Saeed. Assalamu alaikum everyone, it's your brother Zain Bika from South Africa. One of the first educational programs ever produced for Muslim children was the ever popular Adam's World series. The colorful and comical Muslim puppets stole the heart of a generation. Sound Vision will be releasing brand new episodes of Adam's World with the launch of a Adam's World app. Subscribers will enjoy new Adam's World episodes as they are released as well as all the classic episodes of Adam's World. So visit adamsworldapp.com now to learn more, subscribe and enjoy new adventures of Adam and his friends. And let's keep helping tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. Adam's World Believe me there's a lot to see Bismillah Let's explore Okay, and we are back. This is The Real Diagnosis. Uh, I'm your host, Thayer Ahmed. I'm here with Dr. Saeed. We're talking about health and wellness. Um, so, you know, before we left off, you talked to us a little bit about how so many complaints kind of are related to stress management, about uh, how gratitude can play such an important role in recovery and in healing. Um, what are some of your thoughts about how you can convince somebody that all of these things are related? What kind of, I guess, my question to you is, what struggles have you, uh, have you noticed from patients, people who kind of uh, maybe aren't necessarily responsive? How can you get somebody to buy in and be engaged in this process? So multiple ways. Actually, people that see me, one, are, um, have already been down that road. So um, so the person that I had before, the one that nine autoimmune diseases, yes. yeah. um, those are the kinds of people that I normally see. And alhamdulillah, 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 by the grace of Allah, um, I probably have 100% success in improving chronic illness with lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I'm telling you, subhanAllah, people with rare autoimmune diseases. So she no longer, now she's a, we all know that from myasthenia gravis, now she's a scuba diver instructor. Wow. I no longer have, loop, I mean, my mind's in remission or whatever it is that I'm no, no longer off on medications. I have no rashes. I have no symptoms. I'm, so it's, I, I think by the time that actually somebody gets to that point, you don't really need to convince them. Plus on top of that, when you tell them that, I'm not giving you anything that's going to hurt you. We're going to empower you to take charge of your own health because what's going on with all of these chronic conditions is that when somebody has an autoimmunity, mm -hmm. when somebody that we give them an anti-inflammatory, when somebody has um, pain, we give them an anti-inflammatory. When somebody has eczema, what do we give them? An anti-inflammatory. Right. <laughs> when somebody has cancer, anti allergies, anti-inflammatory. So we, as physicians, we all know that the underlying root cause is inflammation. It's your body off balance. This is fire. And there's two different types of 
inflammation. There's an acute inflammation and a chronic inflammation. Acute inflammation is the good inflammation. It's when everything's working. You have a cut. It's unspecific. It's like ancestral. It just goes and attacks it. It fixes what it needs to be fixed, right? And then we have is chronic inflammation is that when that acute inflammation goes on for too long or there's constant stimuluses or there's, it's like it's stuck on the on switch for way too long, it turns into chronic inflammation where basically it destroys this magnificent masterpiece that we were born with. And it's a hidden smoldering fire that eventually destroys your body from the inside out. <laughs> and it's because your body is constantly has all these triggers. So if we can lower the overall inflammation that is leading to your depression, your anxiety, your um, sleep issues, your problems with uh, your eczema or your skin or your acne or any of these chronic conditions and somebody's dealing with pain, if you can lower the overall inflammation naturally with your body's uh, ability to heal itself and giving your body the exact nutrients and the sleep and the rest and the positivity that it needs to heal, you can, when you lower the overall chronic inflammation, you can heal not one of these symptoms, but all of them simultaneously. You can improve these symptoms drastically. Mm -hmm. And that's all. And I think once you explain to somebody that that's, it's not hoo-ha medicine, it's really getting back to the science and then using our lifestyles to figure out, okay, these, we all know diet plays a role. We all know that sleep plays a role. These are just lifestyle-based treatments. Right. And to explain that I'm not giving you any all these crazy supplements or anything, it's just really your lifestyle. And when they see it work, I've had 70 year old. I have had a 70 year old um, who, a couple of 70 year olds that in one week, his uh, rashes, digestive symptoms, you know, all of his chronic symptoms improved. And so it just really, and I think when you get to that stage, but then that's how you convince somebody who's non-Muslim. And now you put the Muslim category in. And that is just so powerful. Because I, alhamdulillah, I've written the book, Be Holistic Rx, Your Guide to Healing Chronic Inflammation and Disease. So my book is in every library in the country. Currently, I'm working on the fourth book and then fifth, fourth and fifth together. But, um, but it's not when I started to speak to Muslim audiences when it really blew my mind. Because... What I have been helping people with is really directly Surah, Surah Baqarah, ayah number 172. Eat a wish that is tayyab, of what Allah has provided, and be grateful to Allah if it is indeed Allah that you worship. Now, before this, in ayah number 166 to 167, Allah talks about a group of people who are standing next to the hellfire with hasarat, multiple regrets of following the social norm blindly. In order to prevent that scene, Allah says, go pray more. He could have said, go fast more, go do this more, go do that more. But what did Allah choose to say? He said, the next ayah, Ya yuhan nas, eat a wish that is halal and tayyab, and do not follow footsteps of shaitan. Indeed, he is your clear enemy. And then it got to me thinking, I'm like, okay, I'm desi, so all I know is zabiha and halal, that's it. <laughs> but that's that's all we know, like, but what's tayyab? Right. And I really, that's when I really dove into, I found a scholar that could help me. And Tayyib is good, peaceful, pure, tranquil, nutritious, safe, while the opposite is a Khabith. And over and over and over in the Quran, probably about 20 sometimes, Allah has says, eat a wish that is Tayyib, what Allah has provided, eat a wish that is Tayyib, Allah, otherwise you're just wronging yourself. He's equated it to success, falah, in this life and the hereafter, he's equated it to um, being believers, he's equated, if you truly worship Allah, like this is heavy stuff. And now if you look at that one ayah, eat a wish that is halal and tayyib and do not follow footsteps of shaitan, we know now that the food science has proven that the foods that you put in your mouth are directly linked to your gut microbiome, right? And that gut microbiome through the vagus nerve is directly linked to your brain. And so the foods that you put in your body have, can either hurt you or help you. And that's exactly what's going on, subhanAllah, in the Quran and Sunnah, where it's, the, we, it's a holistic approach to healing and taking care of yourself. But when I, put, when I get people back to eating halal and tayyab, and that is, yes, get all the artificial foods, because those are not part of our deen. <laughs> artificial chocolates, all those stuff that's destroying our bodies from the inside out. Um, and then when you add in tons of fruits, tons of vegetables, you know, um, clean protein, healthy fats, the way our Prophet Muhammad wasallam used to eat, the body starts healing in ways that you could never imagine just by getting back to the sunnah, just by getting back. And that's not even just for food. We're living in a world right now where we're all negative. 
you know, that they were just, it's like, if you, if you, um, if you were not married, you're like, why aren't you married yet? You know, right. if you are not, if you, <laughs> if you are married without children, why don't you have children yet? I have four boys. Alhamdulillah. What is the first thing that people tell me? Why don't you have kids, girls? Mm -hmm. What do you want me to have? You know, <laughs> but subhanAllah, um, just by getting back and like adding that gratitude back in, truly becoming a people of Alhamdulillah. So showing Muslims that, you know what, our religion is holistic anyway. Allah talks about everything. <laughs> he just doesn't say, I mean, subhanAllah, Allah, if you start to read the Quran, it's so beautiful that Allah tells us even how to greet somebody higher than the person greeted you to, the, to, to something as difficult and as complicated as inheritance. And we think food and our lifestyle is not going to be in there. Allah talks about it all. Our religion is holistic. And if we can truly start living the life according to Quran and Sunnah, eating what is tayyib and living and removing that's khabith and being more grateful, we can put our bodies back into balance and allow our immune systems to work better. So we, it can be more resilient in any time. So uh, this, you brought up uh, a little bit of um, uh, So I wanted to just ask about what are some quick examples? Cause you mentioned kind of what, you know, uh, using the prophetic tradition about some of the, you know, what, what, what was eaten, what was done, what are some quick examples that you've recommended? Because people seem to connect to when they say, hey, this is kind of, this is what the prophet did, you know, uh, peace be upon him. So what would, what do you say in those instances? So in those instances, um, subhanAllah, it just goes back to the way Allah has told us, right? And in Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu one, eat very little. <laughs> I think we need to start there. <laughs> because the, the hadith over and over and over, and Sahih Bukhari hadith, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has told us a believer eats with one intestine, a disbeliever eats with seven. Mm -hmm. I think nowadays the Muslim Ummah is eating with 14. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Seriously, it's crazy. But um, I think that if we just start with that basic, that what and, and to bring into mind that, we don't need to eat till we're stuffed. Right. <laughs> we don't need to be eating all the time. That in and of itself, if you look at the scientific piece of it, eating artificial foods actually, artificial and too much, leads to insulin resistance and leptin resistance. That makes you continue to eat and leads to abdominal obesity and metabolic syndrome and all these crazy stuff things. So eating very little, intermittent fasting, <laughs> you know, incorporating those simple things that our Prophet Muhammad used to do, um, so I always start with that because when you first tell people that, oh, I don't have to eat a lot, <laughs> then what you fill your one third up with, because Prophet Muhammad says, eat one third, one third, one third, one third food, one third air, one third water. And so if you realize, okay, now you know where your one third is, okay, one third, so you don't have to have that much. So for me and for my children and for my families, I only fill this one third up with the most nutrient dense foods that's going to help heal our body, not hurt our body. And that is, again, going back to what Prophet Muhammad used to do, right. right? It's tons of vegetables. He was plant-based. Mm -hmm. There was no Skittles or Dum Dums or McDonald's or all that stuff. He was plant-based, real, whole, nutritious foods. So I put like vegetables, clean protein, healthy fats, you know, olives, um, tons of fr like fruit. Yeah. And just starting with those basics and you realize when you start eating enough healthy fats, when you have a little bit of protein, not a lot of it, remember just a condiment, I think what you do is overeat that. It just a little bit goes a long way, but then lots of vegetables like squashes and mushrooms and you know cucumber, like all of these different types of chard, like which are all prophetic. Um, if we start eating more vegetables, clean protein, healthy fats and fruit and nuts and seeds, we can fill that one third up with the most nutrients. That's what's gonna help heal our gut and our, balance our microbiome help balance our hormones, our insulin levels, and is the most nutrient dense for our bodies to optimal, to work appropriately. Wow, and then that all makes sense. So we'll take a quick commercial break and we will talk more with Dr. Said when we come back, maybe we can touch on COVID and we can touch on a couple of things that everyone who's watching can get going in their lives to start feeling better. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, 
Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. Past campaigns covered a wide range of humanitarian concerns. Through Bosnia Task Force, imams and leaders of Chicago's Muslim community worked to ensure Bosnia became a top national issue. This led to life-saving American policies in Bosnia. A key accomplishment was helping to get rape declared a war crime. Initiatives also included Kosovo Task Force, Central African Republic Task Force, and Flint Coalition, which brought awareness to the water crisis affecting the people of Flint, Michigan. Highlights of our work include supporting Black Lives Matter, Parliament of the World Religions, addressing climate change, so wasteful consumption starts the ruthless production, and that's where we need all the fossil fuel in the world. And prominent media exposure. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, uh, president of Justice for All. And I'm the director of outreach for Justice for All. And that's why we need to go back to what worked. Today we're demanding an apology uh, from the CEO of Costco. The Chinese crackdown on Uyghurs and other Turkic people has only gotten worse. Current programs such as Burma Task Force advocate for the rights of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, internally displaced populations, and all those denied freedom of movement and at risk of starvation. Through this, we mobilized thousands of calls to elected representatives. This paved the way for the U.S. to increase funding for Rohingya refugees from $30 million to over $600 million. Two of our documentaries were featured on international news outlets. The Rohingya People, a slow-burning genocide on BBC World News, and Rohingya Refugees Tell of Massacre was featured on CNN. We've organized rallies, UN mission visits, expanded presentations on campuses, promoted research and report writing, outreach to think tanks, media, and other influencers. Faith Coalition educates about the Rohingya genocide and crimes against humanity faced by ethnic groups in Burma. We've traveled to refugee camps, convened a meeting of Karen, Kachin, and Rohingya leaders, both to encourage cooperation and to guide them in congressional outreach. We organized Rohingya Advocacy Day. This led to over 100 participants visiting the offices of 60 U.S. Senators and congressional representatives. Free Kashmir advocates for the people of Kashmir. Long-term goals include the call for self-determination, the end of the Indian military's occupation of the territory, and raising awareness of Kashmiri issues among the American people. After the August 5th reinvasion of Kashmir, we organized national protests in front of various Indian government buildings, partnered with Stand with Kashmir, and launched a petition condemning the Gates Foundation's decision to present Prime Minister Modi a humanitarian award. Save Uyghur informs Muslims and neighbors of other faiths about the ongoing cultural genocide of Uyghur Muslims and mobilizes public support. Our projects include boycotting Chinese products with our Fast From China campaign, pushing Bill S-178 in the Senate, and organizing a nationwide protest of Costco. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all.
Okay, welcome back to The Real Diagnosis. I'm your host, Ed Ahmed. I'm here with Dr. Saeed. We are talking about health and wellness. Um, we've covered a lot of great topics today, and a lot of it actually, um, if people were to sit down and digest it, uh, you know, pardon the pun, they would probably think uh, mm -hmm. this makes sense. This makes a lot of sense. Um, but what about, I, I guess what I would want to ask you is, you know, we're in this era of COVID right now. There is a lot of uncertainty. People are, uh, their their entire lifestyle has been changed up. So people who maybe were used to going to the gym to exercise, they can't do that anymore. People who were uh, used to just going out, walking outdoors, maybe they're refraining from doing that. What is your uh, advice for what people can do to maintain um, that balance, to maintain that wellness? Are there some tips and tricks that they can do while in quarantine and in, cyphers, and in isolation? What has been your experience thus far? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Alhamdulillah, I do have a book coming out. Uh, Q Publishing wants me to write, uh, well, inshallah, in the next couple of months, it's going to, it's called The Pandemic Prescription, okay. Pearls from Quran and Science to Reinstate Hope Healing uh, for Humanity. So this is something that I'm totally, this is really exciting stuff because I think this is a time where Allah has really given us a chance to pause, you know, and as Muslims, either we can get stuck in that downward spiral of fear, just like where everybody else is going through, which, is, you know, some, a little bit amount of fear is good, sure. but too much when it starts to overwhelm you and take over your daily lives is not so great. <laughs> and, but then when I've been sitting back at home now and really reflecting about what's really going on, I think that's where we need to start is how was our how were our lives before covid and how are our lives blessed now and um because i think before covid we were just we were there was not family time there was limited um you know we were already negative and now when you add another layer of uncertainty now we're all sort of losing it so really that we were never people of alhamdulillah that we got to get back to being having that true tawakkal in allah and I think if we can start developing that connection first with Allah, that makes a huge rest. Because surah, so there is an ayah in the Quran, which I've highlighted quite a bit in my book, and I've talked to a couple scholars about it. And it's surah Nahalai number 112 to 114, where Allah says, I give you an example of a city that was safe and secure in its provisions and abundance coming from every corners. And it became ungrateful to the, to the blessings that Allah has given us. Then Allah basically sent down a punishment of fear and hunger <laughs> and fear and hunger because they denied what the Rasul told, like the prophets have told them. And then the next ayah is how we're going to prevent that. Eat a wish that is halal and tayyib of what Allah has provided. Be grateful to Allah if it is indeed Allah, if you truly are believers. And now that I really feel kind of, we can bring that to light during this time. Because if you're looking at the statistics, the statistics show that those people that are suffering from the comorbidities of COVID-19 are those that have um, other underlining abnormalities or they're obese or they're diabetics, heart disease, hypertension. Those are the people that are um, suffering a little bit more from those complications of COVID-19. And it's because, and now we're looking at the science, is that when you are obese, when you're overweight, when you're um, insulin resistant, meaning metabolically unstable, you know, and right now, if you look at those statistics in America, only 12% of the population is metabolically stable. Wow. wow. <laughs> Just think about that. Only 12% of the population is metabolically stable. The rest of us are metabolically unstable. So if we can use this time as COVID-19 to really take ch take charge of our bodies, and if you look all of obesity, diabetes, uh, heart disease, hypertension, these are all life. We all know our 90, are mostly 90, uh, you know, mostly lifestyle-based diseases. So if we can use COVID-19 to reflect upon our lifestyles, and it starts with, um, you know, being grateful, right? Because that stress in and of itself can lead anybody go down downward spiral. <laughs> because remember, as Muslims. We know that we have no control over our future. Mm -hmm. 17, minimum 17 times a day, we are saying, Ya Allah, please guide us on that right path. We have no idea what our path is. Right. We have no yeah. idea what our future will entail. We have no mm -hmm. idea what our, you know, we can't control our past, but we can control the decisions that we make today. 
And if we can start with just being grateful, getting back to being a people of Alhamdulillah, being thankful for what we have, and instead of looking at everything that's going wrong in our lives, focus on what is going right in our lives. I mean, now, I think this for most of us is like the best Ramadan we've ever had, like I've ever had. <laughs> I didn't have to deal with all of the extra fluff that came with it. It was just me and my Lord. And subhanAllah, and now it's just me and my family. And subhanAllah, if you start looking at the positive, I have all my patients, and even specifically during this time, immediately when they wake up in the morning, say 10 things that you're thankful for. And then the second piece of that puzzle is to really focus on our foods and our lifestyles. So focus on eating real foods, ayyab foods, not khabith foods, because that, inshallah, then will truly take care of the bodies that Allah has gifted us with. And that is the real sense of gratitude. So uh, as we get to kind of wrap up the show, I, I, what I'd like to ask um, are some uh, like these five like quick hit questions for you. Um, may, maybe you can help and our viewers can take this away. Uh, so the first one is if I like meat uh, and I want to eat some meat, what is a good way where I can um, enjoy that kind of protein that comes um, but maybe try to avoid all of the extra unnecessary things with it. Is there anything like some people will say, Hey, do some grilled chicken or, you know, do, you know, what, what, what would you suggest? So with protein, it's cool. just like with everything else, actually it's quality over quantity, but specifically when it comes to protein, mm -hmm. you only need a little bit to go a long way. And if you can focus on the most, the highest quality, and eating a little less of it, for example, grass-fed beef, or pasture-raised or organic chicken, or eggs, or just wild-caught fish, you know, salmon or wild-caught fish, or even pasture-raised organic eggs. So though you can still have all of your protein, you just wanna make sure that it's higher quality, because when you have higher quality protein, then it's basically less inflammatory, less inflammation, and it gives you those nutrients that you need to keep your body running smoothly. Okay, let's move on to uh, good rest and sleep. What is the uh, what is a great tip to ensure that I'm getting good quality sleep? Take this away from you. <laughs> Seriously, this really messes. I think if you can put it on, put it on um, like either airplane mode. Because I feel like if, if the, our lives are such on a roller coaster right now where we don't even know how to quiet our minds. No. So because now even while we're sleeping, we're here hearing little dings and bings and you know like notifications pop up. And if we can push this, push put the push this away, and specifically right before and set a routine of sleep. Because remember, during sleep is when you heal. You need sleep to heal, and we know that if you're not sleeping you have higher chances of getting even infections and viral infections. So it's really important to sleep and heal during your sleep. And the way that we can do that is to make it really count. And that quality, again, is really important. And if we can, you know, create a routine, start setting this aside at a certain time, a couple hours, not eating like two or three hours before you before you go to bed to keep those insulin levels low <laughs> and giving your body a time to re, 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 regenerate downwards. Even sometimes taking an Epsom salt bath right before you go to bed will really help you relax, uh, making sure you pray, do all those duas, and this, like use that time to really connect with Allah, not connect with social media. That right. I think that is really powerful to improve the quality of your sleep. Well, thank you. Um, I think we'll have to wrap up the show. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. I think um, one thing that everybody can come away with is that there are so many opportunities for us to be able to kind of be our best selves and to improve our health and our wellness. Absolutely. So I ask all of our viewers to please look up our host today, Dr. Saeed. She has some publications out there. Take a look. I'm sure there's something in there that people will find that can benefit them on a long-term basis. And hopefully we'll have you back uh, if, you, if, you would, if you would allow us. Absolutely. Thank you. Jazakallah um, khairan. That is our episode for The Real Diagnosis. We'll see everybody next week, God willing, inshallah. And tune in and check us out on muslimnetwork.tv.